What a horrible day. He's really, really miserable. Flipping neck. Well, Sundays I usually like to go out for a walk, but I don't think I will be doing it today. So maybe instead I'll take the opportunity of telling you about a walk I did 15 years ago. Most of us in our lifetimes have had some sort of ambition. And mine, well, it was, it was very special, special to me. Fifteen years ago I finally fulfilled that ambition. It was a walk. It was one of my favourite walks that I ever did. And it stemmed from the days when I grew up in Monmouthshire, in South East Wales. When I lived in the town of Chepstow, I got to know quite a few walks in that area. And two long distance footpaths started from that town. And this is where I'm going to talk about one of them. Offa's Dyke, which was built around the year 789, marked the boundary between the Kingdom of Mercia and Wales, beyond which no Welshman could pass on pain of losing his right hand. It was an earthen rampart, and today stretches of it still remain. A long-distance footpath now runs along Office Dyke, and that was the walk that I did 15 years ago. Office Dyke was built from the Sedbury Cliffs by the Severn Estuary, two miles from the mouth of the River Wye, and extended to the Irish Sea in North Wales, very close to the Dee Estuary. Here is an account of when I did the walk 15 years ago, and this is what I'd like to read to you today, so that I can share with you the experience of this wonderful walk. This bus doesn't go to Beachley, said the driver. It says you do on the timetable, I said. Oh yes, he replied. I was amazed that the driver didn't know where he was driving his own bloody bus. All the other passengers got off at Chepstow which left just me wanting Beachley. The bus went as far as the end of Loop Road, so I walked on up the road to see if I could walk down to the River Severn, but I couldn't reach it without walking in the mud, so I ended up on the slipway under the Severn Bridge. I walked down the slipway, past a woman and a child, and stepped into the river just far enough to get the bottom of my boots wet. I hovered for a while, hoping that the mother and child would walk down far enough then I could ask her to take a photo of me but they didn't and soon turned back. I just took a few pictures myself before moving back up the slipway. I finally reached off a Dyke path and walked along it towards where it begins. When I arrived at the stone that marks the path's beginning, I found a youngish man of about 30 with his wife who were trying to take each other's photo. They noticed me as I approached them. Ah, here's a gentleman who can help us, said the man. Do you want me to take your picture, I asked, and added, you can take mine when I'm taking yours. I took their picture against the stone and took mine with me sitting on top of the stone. I now had proof that I was at the official start of Offa's Dyke Path. I made my way to Granny's house where I was staying for the night. I went to bed just after about 10 o'clock, an early night, to prepare for tomorrow.
The day started off fairly misty, but Granny told me that every morning that week had started off like this. I put on my shorts, as yesterday I had felt hot wearing jeans. 9.30 I set off, all ready for the adventure. sat on a fallen tree nearby and had a drink of lemon leucosate which I had bought from the Gateway supermarket yesterday. I continued on my way when a family also sat down near me. As I approached the descent towards Brockwear, I saw a man and wife of about 50 who were obviously slightly lost. Ah, here's a walker, said the man. Do you know the right way? I led them both towards the paths where you choose to walk off a snake path by either the River Wye or via the Hudnalls. I was going to do the Hudnalls route, but I wanted to stop in Brockweir first for lunch. Anyway, we arrived at the Brockweir Inn, where there was a sign outside saying no muddy boots. So whilst I was changing my shoes, the other two went inside and bought me a sweet cider. It really was sickly sweet. And then I bought myself a dry cider, as the last one was just far too sweet. But unfortunately, it didn't go down too well as the sweet and dry just seemed to clash. I felt rather strange for the rest of the afternoon. I left the pub at 1.30, said goodbye to the couple, and walked back up the hill to pick up Offa's Dyke Path via the Hudnalls route. eventually sat down on a stone wall on the path below the Hudnalls and ate a packet of crisps and drunk some more leucosate. I didn't stop for long anyway and pressed on slowly up the ascent of the Hudnalls and eventually came down the other side to Bigsweir Bridge. Walking along in the exhausting heat seemed endless along the fields and then through Highbury Woods until at last I descended into Redbrook. I felt as though I couldn't continue as I climbed the track out of Red Brook. I stopped again very soon and ate another bag of crisps. I was so tired and felt a bit ill from the cider, but determination to reach Monmouth made me keep moving slowly on. And my God was I slow, until at long last I reached the top of the long gradual climb to the Kaimu. It was a steep path from here to Monmouth, and I shot down it as quickly as I could, eager to reach the town. The B&B I was staying in tonight was, just to add insult to injury, three quarters of a mile out of Monmouth, up a hill. My God, was I knackered when I got there. It was just before seven o'clock, and I wanted to get some food by this time. I sat outside the Bull's Head Inn with a glass of orange juice for a while. So at about nine o'clock, despite being early, 
I wandered back up to my B&B and had an early night. <laughs> lovely day, which started off a bit misty again, but once more I donned my shorts for today's walk. I picked up Popper's Night Path again, at Watery Lane, where I could see a man wearing a blue shirt walking in the same direction, some distance in front of me. It was well signposted through Kingswood, despite my guidebook saying to the contrary. When the path came out of the wood at the other side, it led to a lane at Hendra. I marvelled at the scenery around, just rolling gentle hills and fields. I soon carried on anyway, through more fields, until I came to a really pretty secluded hamlet called Langfy Hangel, Eastern Clamwern. Halfway through for today's walk, I calculated as being Clantinia Croseni, so I was aiming to be there for lunchtime. I eventually got there through the blazing sun at about one o'clock, where I rested for lunch at the Hostry Inn. It was a lovely, cosy little pub, and I ordered some salmon sandwiches. When I'd finished them, the man in the blue shirt arrived and sat on the table with me. He ordered a very strange lunch of cheese on toast and chips. And just to add salt to the wound, I noticed his shirt had white stains on it, which indicated that he hadn't changed it for flipping weeks. I continued on my way, needless to say at this time, leaving him to his lunch. I could really feel the sun on me as I went on, and soon arrived at White Castle. Here I bought a can of orange aid from a not too friendly man behind the counter. The walk was lovely from here, and the sun had gone in a little. I descended into Llanverthyrin, and crossed more fields where I eventually came onto a quiet lost lane that led to Llangatok Lingoid. It was a steep climb up to that village where I saw a young couple picnicking who said they didn't envy me climbing the hill. Eventually, after a few hilly fields, I came in sight of Pandy with the start of the Black Mountains dominating it from behind. When I finally reached Pandy, I continued on a short stretch of Office Dyke Path for the Lancaster Arms that crossed the railway to a lane. Here I left the path for today and walked up the lane towards Old Castle Court where I would be staying tonight. I assumed I had reached Old Castle Court when I came to a white house and two dogs came barking at me. Just as I was about to check in my guidebook, an oldish lady came out of the house to greet me. I had found it all right. It was a lovely farm and she was a very friendly person. I felt at home there straight away. I had a delicious vegetable soup to start for my dinner, followed by cold ham and lettuce with vegetables. Whilst I was eating, I noticed an old pump organ in the room, which I tried to play after dinner, but I couldn't get it to work. Later, I went outside the house to take a photo, where I got talking to the farmer. I told him that I was walking off his dike path, and he said that the stretch across the Black Mountains to here on Y was flat once you got up there. He also said that his daughter could give me a lift into Pandy tomorrow. There were two very old pianos in the lounge, which I had to play on. I was having a wonderful atmospheric evening of music and thoughts of Office Dyke. But the thought of tomorrow's walk across the ridge didn't really make me look forward to it, so I enjoyed my evening as much as possible whilst it lasted. It was all a mad rush in the morning, as I had asked for my breakfast at 8 o'clock, and it was abruptly ended as the farmer's daughter wanted to get off to work, and she was giving me a lift into Pandy. So I left the old castle court sadly but abruptly, but I pleased Mrs. Olive Probert 
when I said that I'd love to come back one day to stay. I was dropped off outside the pub in Pandy, where I continued an office dyke path. It was a slow, long climb up fields and lanes, and I got a bit worried when I saw an acorn symbol directing along a lane down a hill. I soon came to a path which led off it and climbed up again anyway. It was a bit annoying, that's all, as I had lost some height by the short descent, which only meant I had to climb up more again. As I got near the top, the views over Pandy were wonderful. The only trouble was, when I eventually reached the top of the ridge, I couldn't see any of the views, just the top of the adjacent mountains. But I couldn't see anything into the valleys. It was very windy on the ridge. I was wearing my jacket and jeans today, so I was prepared for this. Eventually, and at long last, I could see Hay Bluff, which is at the end of the ridge. To me, it was like seeing a waterfall after a three-month walk through a desert. I consulted my guidebook just before reaching Hayblough, because I seemed to recall that Offers Dyke Path branched off down the mountainside before getting to this point. There were no way marks to show this on the path, so it was just as well that I did look at the guide. It was a very confusing path, which I just managed to follow successfully down the side of the ridge. Upon reaching the mountain road, which leads down to Hay, I wandered over to a refreshments caravan. Here I bought a Kit Kat and a can of lemonade for my supplies. I had already drunk one bottle of lemonade when I was up on the ridge, so I disposed of the empty container in a bin outside the caravan. Continuing along Offers Dyke Path towards Hay, I walked on down the mountain road and crossed a field which was so smooth it was like walking on a velvet carpet. It was a very quiet and pretty descent into Hay, and before long I came across a sign on a tree saying Rosedale B&B with directions off the path. It was handy, as that was the very B&B I was booked in for tonight. So, leaving off Dyke Path for today, I crossed a footbridge down a pretty pathway between some quaint cottages and found Rosedale on the side of the road. Quite a nice spot too, about a mile or so outside of Hay. Later I decided to take a walk into Hay and have a drink. I could hear live jazz coming from somewhere, but I couldn't find the source. I walked all over the town before finally settling into a pub on the Hereford Road. There were hardly any people inside, about seven at the most, so I drank up and went into the Wheat Chief, which was a little fuller, but not by much. I could still hear the jazz when I walked back to the B&B. A really nice atmosphere. A pity in some ways that I have to leave Hay tomorrow. Where Offers Dyke Path leaves Hay, I walked along the River Wye and crossed some fields towards Bettis Dingle. Here I saw another hiker walking behind me, going the same way. It was the man in the blue shirt, who I had seen in the Hostry Inn the other day. I let him catch up with me, so we walked together for the next few miles. A lovely walk this was, along some hidden lanes and rolling fields. My companion kept stopping to pick blackberries, which he told me helped him to keep lubricated from walking. When we reached a pretty walled green track, he stopped for a rest, but I said I was going to walk on so I left him at this point. When I looked at my watch, I realised that walking with him slowed me down a little, so I put the pace on, as I wanted to reach Gladys Street by lunchtime. Having crossed several more fields, I ended up at last in Gladys Street at 1.45. I went into the Royal Oak Inn and found that I wasn't too late to order food, so I ordered a lasagna and chips. The young guy behind the bar was a little bit cock-eyed, started talking to me. He was asking if I was walking off his dyke and how far I was going. Before long, the man in the blue shirt arrived. I expected him to turn up sooner or later. He ordered a plowman's, and while he was eating, I noticed that it was raining again outside, but harder this time. At three o'clock, the pub closed, and we had to move on despite the fact that it was still raining. I put on my raincoat this time, 
At least the good thing was that I knew that it was only a three mile walk over Hergist Ridge to Kington. As we were crossing Hergist Ridge, the man in the blue shirt finally revealed his name to be Bert. We were in deep discussions as we walked together, and to be perfectly honest, the rain didn't spoil my enjoyment of the walk, it just added atmosphere. It wasn't until we started walking downhill towards Kington that it started raining hard. Lucky for us at this time, we were near the end of Hergist Ridge, so we were, we were able to take shelter under the trees nearby for a while. We soon pressed on our way, as I was keen to reach my B&B by this time. My consolation was that I knew my stop tonight was actually on the path. I saw it clearly from a distance, Wilner House, right next to the Royal Oak. I shook hands with Bert, who went on his way. Anyway, I crossed the road to Wilner House and Mrs Vera Jones came to the door. I was dripping wet, so she hung up my raincoat for me and gave me a pot of tea. I had a bath shortly afterwards, so felt much refreshed after my wet afternoon. Tomorrow I'm looking forward to, as from Kington onwards I don't know what to expect at all, as I've never seen any of the dyke or ever visited any of the places it passes through, so it will be a new adventure for me. I climbed steeply at Bradnell Hill, past the apparently highest golf course in the country. Crossing several fields, I came to Rushock Hill, where the path met up with the dike itself again, after not seeing it since Redbrook. The path ran along the top of the dike here, which was bigger than I had seen it in the Y Valley. The views were marvellous as I walked along. Eventually the path descended again, where I came into a valley at Lower Harpton. I followed the road then for a while, and where the path branched off again, I started to climb again. It was a fairly gradual climb, not too steep, up Newcastle Hill, where it started to rain. It wasn't much, and it very soon died away. I took a stop for lunch at the top of this hill, sat down on a fallen tree. The climb up Furrow Hill from here was a steep one. I kept stopping every few seconds to catch my breath, but still pressed on. When it levelled out a bit, I sat down for a while, before continuing further uphill to Hawthorne Hill. The path usually ran along the top of the dike along all these hills. Soon enough, I left off as dike path for today, as I turned off down the lane for my stop tonight. I found it very easily, Rydale, a bungalow with no indication that it was a B&B. Upon meeting Mrs. Diana Wells, I felt at home almost straight away. The bungalow was very clean and well kept, but apart from that, she gave me a cup of tea and a slice of cake to go with it. Then, she brought me a piece of chocolate cereal slice. I felt like the long lost son returned home again. I put on a brisk pace this morning, determined to get to my stop near Montgomery tonight before meal time. After half an hour, I arrived in Knighton. Offersdyke Path led me through Offersdyke Park before leaving Knighton completely. It climbed steeply up Panpunton Hill where the dyke itself appeared again. The path ran along the dyke for practically all of today's walk. I felt very isolated when walking along the dyke up Cranfair Hill as it was quite bleak 
and very high up. I kept my brisk pace up, determined to reach my destination in good time. Arriving on a farm track here, I saw dozens of sheep grouped together on the other side of the gate through which I had to walk. It was a hilarious experience as the sheep just scattered around me. They could only run in front or behind me as the track was fenced in. The walk on was lovely, lots of secluded little valleys. The only trouble was it was all hills, hills and more bloody hills, which didn't help me whilst I was trying to move fast. Reaching Nut Bank, I descended again to Church Town. It was the steepest climb of the day from here. At the top, I came to a stile, and when I looked back at the scene, it was the same as the photograph on the cover of my guidebook, taken from Eden Hope Hill. There was just a short stretch of Offerstyke Path to the Ditches Farm, where according to my map, there was a path off the dike from here to Little Brompton Farm, where I would be staying tonight. At Little Brompton Farm, Mrs. Gaynor Bright showed me to a nice room in which I flaked out on the bed, happy to have finally made it after a long, hard day. I had managed to get here for 5.30, which wasn't bad going, but Mrs. Bright said that dinner wouldn't be served until 7.30. Well, that at least gave me time to rest a while and then have a nice hot bath. At dinner, I had a table to myself. A young couple behind me invited me to join them at their table but I thanked them and said I was okay. There was an old couple on another table. The man was a member of the Office Light Path Association, but said he'd never been to Knighton. They had just come back from the Lake District on some sort of geology lecture. The young couple was spending a few days in the area driving around. Benjamin, the young man, was very witty and made me laugh all evening when we were in the lounge. After the old couple had retired to bed, Benjamin was having a good long look in my guidebook particularly on Montgomery. I said that Offers Dyke Path doesn't actually go through the town, but he said you can actually see the castle on the hill from miles away. Anyway, I went to bed with a nice thought of walking flatter country than the steep valleys I had walked up and down today. I didn't hurry off this morning. I left about 9.30. The walk was easy for the most part of the day compared to yesterday. It was a nice flat walk along the dike in a straight line following fields. There was one very steep but short climb after about three miles, but then it levelled out again. Upon reaching Forden, the path followed the busy main road from Montgomery to Welshport for a while, before turning off along a lane where I started to climb again. This would be the only major climb of today's walk. I eventually arrived at Buttington in the valley, where I managed to get a quick pint at the Green Dragon, as it was about half past two. I went into the lounge, and it wasn't until after I sat down that I noticed a sign on the door saying, no dirty, wet or heavy boots in the lounge, please. No one said anything to me, so I drank my beer very quickly and left before someone did. The path followed the Shropshire Union Canal to Pool Quay. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw my being me for tonight, the Paris Arms. It was a grotty looking place. Alan Wally, the landlord, led me up the shabby stairs to my room. There were no carpets on the floor and no wallpaper on any of the walls. It looked dreadful. Anyway, I went back down to the bar where I had a cup of tea and there were two of the local regulars there looking rather pissed. They were very talkative to me, though. One of the blokes was dreadfully overweight, and he said to me, Ah, get the beer down here. He and his mate were drinking Murphy Stout. Anyway, they left just before four, and I went upstairs for a bathroom, the scruffiest bathroom I'd ever used in the B&B. &B. After nine, I went back down to the bar again, for a drink. All the locals were here by this time. Alan Wally's wife was sat down with some of the locals, who acknowledged me as I came in. I sat down near them, as she had invited me to do so. The girl sat by her was called Alison, and she kept getting pestered, in a humorous and harmless way, by Elwyn, an old bloke who seemed a real dirty old bugger. He kept touching her up all the time, although she kept on laughing. Elwyn was mad, but before the end of the night, 
he had me in hysterics the way he was going on. He bought me a pint, even though I said I didn't want one. And I went to bed quite soon afterwards. I struggled through my breakfast this morning. The eggs tasted a bit funny, and what was more horrifying about it was when I was eating my bacon, at one point I found a dead fly squashed on it. Offers Dyke followed the canal again, as far as Llanimenich. I stopped for a pint in a pub where two women looked round at me as I entered. Leaving this village, the path became hilly again, and the atmosphere was much nicer now. On Llanimenich Hill, Offers Dyke Path climbed past the golf course before descending to Porthy Wine. I climbed from here to Nantmauer and Mocketh Hill part of which was a nature reserve. At the top of this hill, I found a very tall pole with the Office Dyke Path signs on it. It's certainly very windy up here. I knew I couldn't be far from my stop for tonight, Tinny Coid Farm, so I pressed on pretty hilly fields through Trevormen before dropping steeply to the old mill inn in Llanforda. This is where I left the path again for today, but I got a bit lost trying to find Tinny Coid Farm. So I asked a young bloke at a nearby house, who directed me to it, down through some woods. It was a posh looking secluded house in the valley, but very nice. A man wearing shorts and glasses in his late thirties showed me to my room. It was a really clean looking room, with its own bathroom and a TV. As I walked back downstairs, a sporty looking lady shook me by the hand and introduced herself as Jill. She then went off to play squash. Later on, I sat in my room watching TV. I was watching a very funny half hour film on Channel 4 before I went to bed. Rejoining Offers Dyke Path, I climbed up through the woods wearing my jeans, jacket and coat, but soon felt really hot so I took off my jacket. In the woods, I had to scramble over a fallen tree, blocking the path, so I got my jeans really dirty in the process. The path left the woods and came out onto an old race course. There was an apple tree here, which is right by the path, so I picked some apples from my rucksack, as the tree wasn't in anyone's garden. Continuing on much further, when I saw a cow with her calf lying in front of the stile I had to cross over. I carefully walked by, but the cow got up and snorted at me as I passed, so I felt a bit nervous. Before long, I got my first view of Chirk Castle. It was a long descent towards it, and then a long climb up again. As I passed through a farmyard, I got barked at by dogs everywhere, and a pig snorted at me. Then I came to a field where there were some pheasants again. As the path dropped down to meet the A5 and the Shropshire Union Canal again, I left the dike itself for the last time. Apparently the path follows a more scenic route to rest at it from here onwards. At the Irish Bridge, a road worker got talking to me. He seemed friendly, and he said it was a nice walk along the canal to Flangotham. Following the canal again, I saw several barges. I arrived at Fromsa Silt where Offers Dyke Path leaves the canal and follows the road to the River Dee below Porsisilt. Crossing the River Dee, I climbed up again shortly, crossed over the canal again and climbed high above the valley into some lovely woods called Trevor Hall Wood. Eventually, I came out of the wood onto a quiet lane below the tops of the mountains, high above the Vale of Llangothlan. It was a lovely stretch of road between the high crags and the wood called the Precipice Walk. Fairly soon, the wood gave way to the view of the valley. I took in what I saw, and one thought came to mind. Wow! It was a wonderfully dramatic view of the Llangothan, with a Casaldinus Bran towering over it, towards which the road was heading. I fell in love with this valley straight away, and thought to myself, 
I hope Van Gotham is, is pretty close up. My tired and aching feet slowly took me off off the stony path, down the lane to Van Gotham. I was just dreading the thought of having to walk back up here tomorrow morning to meet off the stone. Reaching the town, I was overcome with delight. It was a glorious place, a very picturesque town, which I made up my mind this was the best place I'd visited whilst journeying on off a stake. It was a good 10 minute walk down Abbey Road to Glanelon, where I was staying tonight. The house wasn't really glamorous, but it was good enough for me, and Betty Collins seemed really nice. It wasn't long before I had changed, and I was walking back into the town again. It was a smashing place. I only thought it a shame I'm not here for long. Still, as I always say with places like this, I can always come back. I was looking for a place to eat, as I wasn't dining at my B&B, and soon I came to the Grape Hotel. I had a pint, but nothing to eat in there, so I walked on until I found another hotel, which seemed a lot more inviting. I ordered a drink, but it was some time before I ordered any food. I had scampi and chips, preceded by a tasty vegetable soup. The girl serving the food kept smiling at me, but I don't know whether it was because she was just naturally friendly or what. Her name was Beverly. On my way back to Glanham, I stopped in a pub called Jenny Jones, which apparently is a well-known Welsh inn. I've never heard of it though. Inside the bar was rather empty, just one man talking to the barmaid and another lady, who I assume was the landlady. She eventually called over to me and asked if I was okay sitting there on my own. I assured her that I was, but then I left when she was occupied. I was in a good mood tonight after three pints, in a lovely town, on my way back to bed. I was then thinking of the nice short eight mile walk tomorrow, a much deserved rest. Apparently though, the path across Clanbeglan Moor is very troublesome, so I look forward to my shorter journey tomorrow along the Dyke Path with curious anticipation. Climbing out of Clangoth up that lane again wasn't as bad as I had thought, but I was glad when I reached off the Dyke Path again where it levelled out. The path continued following the precipice walk for a while again until it followed a rather treacherous mountain path with loose scree. I eventually walked into a wood and where I emerged the other side the path rejoined the lane at World's End. It was a gradual climb up here and soon the lane came out onto Clandegla Moor. It became rather windy and drizzled on and off so where the path left the road again I put on my jacket and coat. Now this was the path where, according to my guidebook, was very troublesome and ill-defined across Clandegla Moor and the woods beyond. But I found it very easy to follow. The path across the moor was very clear, with wooden posts marking it very, every so often. Then the path through the woods to Harold Bilston was also straightforward and well marked. Upon reaching Clandegla, just before two o'clock, I left the path again for today and had a pint in the crown, and then I walked along the dangerous road to Saith Doran Farm, my B&B. Mrs. Pat Thompson looked as though she wasn't sure of me at first, but she was friendly enough later on. She gave me a pot of tea and biscuits, and I sat in the conservatory. Dinner was at six. I was the only one eating in the room tonight. I had a piece of pizza with baked potatoes and stuffed tomatoes. Actually, even though the tomatoes were cooked, they weren't too bad, as they were filled with sage and onion stuffing. Patricia, who was Pat Thompson's seven-year-old granddaughter, hovered around whilst I was eating. She started showing me leaflets at the local area. I think she took a shine to me, as a lot of kids always seem to do, as I was made to play a trivial pursuit for kids, and then she was showing me how to make a mess by tearing paper and putting blobs of plasticine on. Pat Thompson's husband was taking their granddaughter Patricia into Clandegla, where she attends school, and he very kindly gave me a lift into the village too, 
from where I could pick up Office Dyke Park again today. Leaving Clandegla then, I continued on my way towards the hills I had heard so much about the previous night. Descended from the Jubilee Tower, passing an American couple walking the other way. We stopped briefly for a chat to discuss where we were all going. The woman told me that they had stayed in Bodfari last night, which is where I was heading for today. I also discovered that they had stayed in the same B&B in which I would be staying. Oh, are you staying with Mrs. Owen? Oh, you'll love her, she said. I arrived at Bodfari and met Mrs. Owen. She was a dear old lady who lived on her own. I had a bath, then went out to the pub up the road for a meal. I walked around Bonfari village before heading back to the B&B. I sat in the lounge and talked with Mrs Owen for the rest of the evening. Later on that night, I went to bed thinking that tomorrow is the last day of the walk. This is it, the final day. I have thoroughly enjoyed the past couple of weeks walking this path, but I am glad that I have nearly reached the end. I could see Prestatin and the sea in the distance. I finally descended into Prestatin, where the path led onto a long straight road leading directly to the sea. There was another large stone just before the beach, marking the end of Offa's Dyke Path. I stopped a lady walking nearby and asked her to take my photo to prove that I had reached the end. I walked onto the beach afterwards and walked into the sea to make it official that I had walked from coast to coast. I also picked up another pebble which meant I had a stone from each end of the walk. After I had finished congratulating myself I went on my way to find the guest house in Prestatin where I would be spending this final night. The food was very good. And a nice meal. After dinner, I walked into Prestatin and went into a couple of pubs to celebrate by completing the whole length of Office Dyke Path over the past 12 days. I even came across a pub called the Office Dyke Inn. So there you go. I had fulfilled my childhood ambition to walk the whole length of Office Dyke Path. It was a great walk. Probably the greatest walk I've ever done.